Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so I just joined the C3 in November. So this is a great opportunity for me to kind of introduce myself to a lot of people here who are from UNAM and from C3. So uh, please like come and talk to me and get to know me, that kind of thing after the talk, please. Uh, but previously I was at Georgetown University uh, doing a postdoc. So I'm going to present some work that I did there. And the title of the talk is Can Disease Latency Exploit the Rhythm of Human Behavior? Now I understand that a lot of people probably might not know what I mean by disease latency or what I mean by human behavior. The diseases I'm talking about are infectious diseases, things like flu and the common cold, and the human behavior is uh, social behavior and, and the kind of interactions we have that allow those diseases to get transmitted. Um, so the easiest way, so the first five minutes of this talk, I'm just gonna talk about what disease latency is, because it's really important for the rest of the talk that you understand. Uh, an easiest way to explain it is to um, talk about how we model infectious diseases. So normally we would have a, a population of agents, and each one of those individuals could be in one of a number of states. So probably the simplest example is when you have only two states, either susceptible or infectious. And when two of these agents come into contact with each other or have an interaction, then the, uh, in the susceptible individual can transition to an infectious state. So uh, if we're going to do a simulation or some kind of modeling around this, you have a parameter that tells you the probability that that transition is going to occur. And that's what beta is in this example. Now, intuitively, it's kind of easy to understand beta. If beta is very large, that means transition happens more frequently and epidemics are larger. If we want to make the simulation a little bit more complicated. Uh, we could add in a recovered state or a removed state in this case. Uh, but to um, you know, to simulate that, you have to add in an extra parameter, which would be the, um, the length of time that someone stays in the infectious state before transitioning to the removed state. Uh, and that's what we call the infectious period. Now, again, intuitively, if the infectious period is long, that gives people a very long bit of opportunity to, um, to infect other individuals. Now, to make it even more um, accurate, most diseases have a period in between the uh, I mean, between becoming infected and becoming infectious, which is usually called the exposed state. So you have this SEI model, and we have another parameter that we add in, which is delta E. This is what we call the latent period, or latency period. And um, so in that, uh, that you can be infectious, infected but not infectious. So the thing is about this one, whereas with beta and with delta i, it was quite intuitive what their effect would be on the outcome of the epidemic. You know, a large out, larger epidemics happen when there's a long infectious period and large high value of the transmissibility. But with the latent period, it's not really that obvious. So if I ask you now, just have a little think, you know, would a larger latent period create larger epidemics or would a shorter and that's the essence of the question that we're, that we're asking in this um, talk. So there's some data from, from real diseases. Rhinovirus is just the same thing as a common cold. Um, and people have done studies where they take volunteers into a lab and then they inoculate those volunteers with the disease. And then periodically, every few hours, they'll go and look um, and take uh, kind of swabs from their mouth and nose to work out how uh, how many viral titers they could find, how much viral shedding there is. So with rhinovirus, what they found in this one study is that after inoculation, there's a period of no viral shedding, which lasts for six to eight hours. Uh, and that's what we call the latent period. It's just a period. This other, so this is this period here. is what we call the latent period. And what it isn't is the time between becoming inoculated and the time showing symptoms, because the symptoms start much earlier. So in this case, you could be coughing and sneezing and that kind of thing, but uh, you wouldn't be able to infect anybody until it gets a little, a little bit later. Uh, similarly, uh, with influenza, there's other studies done in a similar way. Here they find kind of the opposite way around, where the um, there's some kind of 
later period, or a period where there's very little viral shedding, but then it peaks after about two days, and, but symptoms don't start till about three days. So that means there's a day where these inoculated patients would be you know, able to infect other people, but probably unaware that they actually have the disease in the first place because they're not showing any signs of it. So yeah, just to summarize, what is disease and latency? It's the time between the uh, moment an individual receives the infection and the time that they're able to infect others, but it's not the incubation period, which is the time between getting infected and starting to show symptoms. And my belief after studying this kind of thing is that the, the difference between these two periods is an extremely important uh, variable or um, quantity when we consider diseases and how epidemic spread. And that's basically because of the way we react when we get sick. So I'm going to give you a, oh, sorry, for first there's, yeah, just in the real world, these bars just represent the kind of our literature view, review and the, the kind of range of values that we found across lots of different studies. Uh, I say lots, there's not actually very much data out there on, on this, but you can see there's a lot of variation, a lot of different kind of time scales. So we're mainly thinking about things like uh, influenza and um, rhinovirus, which, which operate on a time scale of a few days. So, um, yeah, so my uh, research has been studying the kind of intersection, or the, the interaction between human behavior and infectious diseases. So in a very simplistic cartoon kind of example, we can think of human behavior as being a, a cyclic phenomena. You know, we all sleep at nighttime. We generally all go to work in similar kind of workplaces or schools. Uh, and then we have our social lives in the evening. So we switch between these different phases of behavior. Now, if you imagine what happens when somebody gets infected with the disease in this situation, say uh, this individual is, it, is, is one of your students, for example, and this is you, um, and that one day you, know, you, get infect, you, you come into contact with that person. So you get infected, but you don't immediately go into the infectious state. You're into a, a latent period state. And let's say that that period, for the sake of this example, is 12 hours. So then later on, you're socializing with your friends, you're infected, but you're not able to infect them, because the disease is in the, is in the latent uh, state. Then it's later on, 12 hours after you got infected, you're in bed, that's when the infection kicks in, and you start coughing, you start sneezing, and you say, well, I'm sick, so I'm not gonna go, go to work. So the following day, you, you, you're not here, you're not able to infect anyone, you're not here, so you're not able to infect anyone. So that's the end of that uh, branch of the tree of, of infection. So if you assume, on the other hand, that the infection period is 24 hours, again, you get infected at work by the same student, and uh, later on, you know, you're still in that latent state. Later on, you're still in that latent state, so it's different this time. And then it's 24 hours later when you're... Um, back in the same situation you were the previous day, that's when you become infectious, and then you're able, uh, you're able to infect other people, so the infection is able to continue. So this is the conceptual example of how I think uh, disease latency can exploit the rhythm of human behavior. Different latent periods uh, create different uh, effects for the disease, different uh, epidemic sizes. So, uh, Really, yeah, we've got the dynamics of human behavior, the dynamics of, any, of the disease, and the question is, are these able to synchronize with each other? Um, so the way I'm going to test this uh, is firstly by using some, some data that's previously been collected. Sociopatterns.org has got all these awesome data sets. They're all collected in a very similar way. So they went into situations like a conference, for example, and gave every participant something to wear around their neck which is um, a sort of transmitter that can transmit and receive signals. So whenever two people were within a particular um, distance of each other, then that information would be recorded. So we would know the identities of the two people and the time that, that the interaction occurred. So this is what I call a temporal network. So it's a social network where we actually know the times that the interactions occurred. And then if you just sort of draw histograms of um, 
the total activity per hour uh, along here, or maybe per, per minute, I can't, I can't remember. But um, you see, you get these kind of waves of behavior which correspond to the times when people are actually collecting the data. So we, there, there are missing interactions in between that, that would obviously occur, but um, we do get a kind of approximation to this like, rhythm of human behavior. We get periods of high activity and periods of low activity. Uh, so the conference was three days, the hospital was four. The school was actually only two days, but we wanted to test epidemics on a longer time scale. So we just looped that data to create five days, and then we kind of looped the seven days to create an effect of uh, you know, weeks and weekends. And it's actually six weeks long, but I've only got it to two. So the first way we asked uh, you know, whether diseases fare better or worse, depending on the latency period, is to measure something called reachability. So the reachability measures uh, how one person is connected to another person in the context of a transmissible disease. So one person X can reach another person Y if there's a chain of interactions that occur that, can, uh, that, that would make it possible for a disease to try transmit from that person X to person Y. So, and this is a function of the latent period, and it's a function of other variables. But this just example just shows three individuals. So at the very beginning of this time period, X interacts with Y. X is infectious, so they infect Y. Y then goes into their exposed state, the latent period. Then they go into the infectious period, then they recover. And by the time that Y is interacting with Z, uh, they've already recovered, so the, um, the infection doesn't transmit. Whereas if we have the 24-hour latent period, uh, it's actually while Y is interacting with Z that the infectious period begins, and that means X can reach Z in this situation. And then just for any individual, you can just count the reachability to every other individual, and that would be their, um, their score. It's like a centrality measure. We also have to... Uh, make an assumption about the uh, infectious period here. And in this example, um, or in this case, we're just assuming a very short infectious period of two hours, which isn't biologically realistic at all, but it represents the time, well, we're assuming anyway, between somebody becoming infectious and the time that they realize they have an infection due to symptoms and decide to self-remove themselves from the system. So it very much depends on a kind of behavior change idea, and a literature on that, uh, where people are studying how people um, actually do react to the symptoms of diseases. So I'm not pretending that this is realistic in any way, but it's a, an arbitrary choice that we decided to make. Uh, so here are the results from measuring reachability. Again, I've just plotted the, um, the overall activity uh, along the top, just as a reference. And then here's the reachability results we get for different latent periods. And like I kind of said in the example, uh, when the latent period is synchronized at, at times like 24 hours, 48 hours, we get these peaks of uh, reachability, which would um, suggest that, that that's when the largest, the largest epidemics can happen. Um, so, uh, and then the, the, so the 12 hour sort of bottom, the, the dip, that kind of represents people who are getting in, receiving an infection at the beginning of the day or, or during the day, but 12 hours later, there's no interactions for that, inter for that disease to transmit to any new people. Um, and the reason uh, dips, these, these peaks get lower is just because of the limited time span of the data. Um, but in the, um, in the school situation where we had uh, six weeks of data, uh, we actually find that the biggest peak is at uh, seven days. So this corresponds to people who are infected on, on one day of the week, for example. If they got infected on Wednesday of week one, they can uh, be a second generation of infections on the Wednesday of week uh, two, third generation of infections on the Wednesday of week three, and, and so on. So um, this is really just a kind of... Con show the concept of, of why we believe that the later period could synchronize, but it's not really biologically realistic. So the next step was just to test uh, the sensitivity of these results. So we did some uh, disease simulations that are a lot more realistic 
uh, have lots of parameters and heterogeneity and distributions in them. And a few things that I wanted to test, which I thought would uh, specifically break that synchronization pattern are, uh, for example, people might not show symptoms or you know, if they do have symptoms, they might not react to them. So some people, they get a cold, they're coughing and they're sneezing, but they still go into work anyway and infect other people. Uh, the length of time that people persevere with those symptoms could change. So I've said that this latent period is, is two hours, but we could have a few outlying, outlying people, people who just you know, act a little bit differently so if we have a distribution of latent periods, that just means there's, there could be a fat tail. And this is one sort of thing that I'm testing in the model, but I call it uh, perseverance. So this would just create a few more um, what you'd call super spreaders in the, in the situation. And um, the variance in the latent period could, uh, could be different. We don't really have any, I mean, not much data about what the latent period of diseases are, and it could be different for every individual host. I think Roberto sort of mentioned something very similar to that. Um, so we don't know, so it's something to put in the simulation and just try and test all the different parameters uh, values that we can. Uh, and then finally, the, the infectious period could be longer. So like in the example with uh, flu, the symptoms didn't kick in until 24 hours after the individual started um, viral shedding. So that infectious period could um, you know, really be, be quite a long time, um, much longer than the two hours that, that we assume. And so to test whether synchronization exists, we simulated the disease for uh, each individual 100 times with a latent period of 22 hours. So that corresponds to one of those peaks in, uh, in the epidemic um, pre prevalence. Uh, and then we compare it to 100 outbreaks with a later period of 10 hours, which corresponds to one of those valleys in the uh, reachability. And just, you know, subtract one from the other to get the difference between uh, the two. And that's what we call the effect of synchronization. And then for each of these parameters I mentioned in the previous slide, we uh, start with a baseline simula simulation, which kind of creates where the effect of synchronization is actually quite high. And then we perturb that one parameter away from those baseline um, variables to see at what point does the uh, effect of synchronization disappear. So you can see that for, for asymptotic uh, individuals, people who don't react to the disease, you can still have quite a large number of people in there and still see that there's an advantage to having a synchronized uh, infectious uh, latent period. Uh, similarly, for the, the variance in the latent period, we get a result you know, that there is a large range of parameters where it, where it does uh, play a role. And then for things like perseverance and the actual length of the infectious period, you actually get an increase at the beginning. And this is simply because these things boost the, the number of, overall number of infections, that occur. They, the overall transmissibility and the size of the epidemic. So, Increasing these numbers initially just creates you know, a larger epidemic, so you see larger differences between the two, but then eventually it does break when you get to, to larger parameters. So this basically means that you can have up to about a 15-hour um, infectious period. Uh, so that's 15 hours that somebody's infected and in the system before they self-remove themselves or before the, the disease just goes away because of their immune system, and you still see that there's an advantage for a later period to be uh, 22 hours over 10 hours. Uh, and we did this for all of the data sets uh, and got similar results for all three. So that previous one was just showing the school data. Um, so there's uh, one other thing that uh, we need to address, which is the fact that there's a lot of missing data in these data sets. So between you know, the, these times, Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Time. Uh, so there's a lot of mis missing data, and there's not really anything we can do about that. We can't go back and you know, ask these people who they were interacting with during those times. Uh, or we would need a much better data set where people are possibly using their mobile phones or something like that to record every interaction that they had. So instead of trying to use empirical data here, we can uh, do some sort of simulation. And 
we have these three phases of uh, human behavior here. So this is the kind of basis for our model. And we can think of it as a, a multi-layered network. So in the sleep layer, you've got a very sparse network where you're very unlikely to really be interacting with anyone, but there might be some pairwise interactions there. Then you have your work layer. So you, it, within the network, you'll have these clusters that represent you know, your workplace, your colleagues, and then your social life where you would expect the clusters to be, be different. There might be some overlap, but it's, it's mostly a, you know, a different set of people that you're interacting with. And uh, I imagine that, that having these extra layers would actually kind of diminish the effects of our, our synchronization that we saw, because a, less of the ep epidemics would be dying out in those hours where you're not at work, or you're not at the conference, or the hospital, or the school. Um, which would basically be th this layer. So there would be more opportunities for transmission, but you might see that there's some other effects. So for example, uh, if, the, if, if somebody comes, becomes infected here, if there's a 24 hour latent period, then they will become infectious here. So you would expect this network to really be the dominant network in determining how the, the early stage of epidemic grow. Whereas if the infectious period is a little bit longer, you would get an effect of there being uh, sort of some transmissioning happening in this layer, and then some more transmissioning transmission happening in this layer. Uh, and I don't really entirely know what the effect is going to be. And this is like really very recent stuff that I, I did this. I finished doing this last night. So I'm going to show you some results, but I don't really have a full kind of interpretation of these results. So I'm not really going to enlighten you fully, but. Uh, the, the simulation was involved me, uh, involved uh, having a, a kind of group of people, and then between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. when they're at work, they have a, a social network that looks like this. So people are connected to their neighbors and their, you know, people who are, are close to them. Uh, this is technically a ring lattice, and these have periodic boundary conditions, which I didn't draw. And then in the sort of home time or in your social time uh people are connected just as much but uh virtually in its time so the people they associate with work are totally different to the people they associate with at home and then at night time there's no connections at all um, and we can vary uh, the number of people in each row and we can vary the number of people in each column to see the effects of having different sizes of groups uh, in these different situations uh, so if we have five people in the layer and then 10 in the home layer, we just, this is the reachability like I've shown before, uh, and you get quite low levels of reachability. And I think the peak of this kind of corresponds to infections that, that start in this layer. They can infect uh, anybody in this layer. Um, so that, that would be the valley. I think, uh, Ed, but the peaks correspond to infections that happen in this layer and then in this layer, but then they kind of die out when they reach uh, this layer, which might not happen directly afterwards, but it happens, you know, at, at some point in time. Uh, and then this one, I mean, there's all kinds of peaks and valleys in here, so I need to spend a bit of time trying to interpret that figure. Uh, but in general, the, the reachability is, can reach higher uh, values, so I think um, obviously, the number of people in each of these uh, layers um, has, a, has an important effect. So this is something that I'm planning to uh, explore more and do some real simulations instead of just looking at reachability. But uh, hopefully from these two uh, figures, you can see that there's an effect of, of the latent period, firstly, and an effect of the network structure in each of these different layers. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's like I said, I did this in Georgetown University. It started out as a, uh, an undergraduate project, and I was the mentor to Kristen, um, and uh, Shrek Mansell was my advisor, so uh, I'd like to give a lot of thanks to them. Uh, the paper is on archive, and this is the name, this is the link. So, uh, thank you.